Hello, everybody, and uh, a very warm welcome to uh, this evening's meeting of the Blake Society and Friends. We are delighted this evening to be able to welcome the writer John Higgs, who is going to talk to us about his uh, new book, uh, William Blake versus the World. There it is, in its glorious, colourful front cover. Um, my name, confusingly, is also John. Uh, I'm one of the trustees of the Blake Society. And um, just before we get going, I'm just going to um, outline the uh, structure of the event and what will happen. So um, we've got an hour and a half uh, with John. And uh, to begin with, I'm, I'm, in a moment, I'm going to hand over to John Higgs, and he's going to do a, a 10 minute or so introduction uh, about his book and his ideas about Blake. And uh, then after that, uh, John and I will, will talk about the book um, for perhaps half an hour, something like that. And uh, then at about uh, quarter to nine, we'll um, open it up as a, a Q&A to everybody. So uh, you will have a chance to um, ask John your questions. So just before I do that, uh, I'm going to give the obligatory plug for the Blake Society. Um, it looks like we've got a lot of people joining us this evening, which is wonderful. And I suspect that quite a few of you have um, followed uh, John Higgs in reading his earlier books. And hopefully your interest in Blake has been piqued by his, uh, his new book. So um, if Blake seems to you to be, to be someone you're interested in and would like to explore further, then uh, please consider joining the Blake Society. We have uh, monthly events that we organize, which normally focus on an aspect of Blake or his work or his life uh, or related, um, related uh, fields of interest. And uh, you can go to our website, which is blakesociety.org, he says, checking he's got that right. And you can see uh, events that we've got coming up in the next few months and uh, look at events that we've held recently. It's uh, 25 pounds a year to join or uh, 15 pounds concessions. And again, uh, you can find details of that on the membership page of the website. So spiel out of the way, let's press on. Um, I'm just gonna uh, read a, a short introduction um, to John Higgs and then hand over to the uh, man himself. John Higgs is a writer, journalist and cultural historian. His books have covered topics including Musical Mavericks, the KLF, The Ancient Road of Watling Street, A Cultural History of the 20th Century, and an attempt to imagine what might befall us in the 21st century and beyond. Though thrillingly eclectic, they have tended to weave together the stories of countercultural icons and antagonists, including Timothy Leary, Robert Anton Wilson, Ken Campbell, Blake Society patron, Alan Moore, and now, William Blake. In 2019, as the Tate's Blake exhibition illuminated pre-pandemic London, John published William Blake Now, a slim volume of essays wrapped in a psychedelic green cover that, like John the Baptist in the wilderness, teased the arrival, the, the arrival of its heftier cousin. That book, William Blake versus the World, erupted into our world last month, and we are delighted that its author, John Higgs, has joined us this evening to talk about it. Other more important, John, over to you. <laughs> Lovely, uh, thank you, John. Thank you so much for that. Um, it's quite an honor to uh, be talking to the Blake Society. Uh, so um, thank you all for coming. I should really uh, introduce myself and try and tell what I wanted to achieve with this book, basically. Um, as John was saying, um, I am an author. Um, I'm only an author. Uh, about 10 years ago, I made the perhaps foolhardy decision to try and make a living writing books. And it's been um, a busy 10 years. Uh, and I've got about 10 books uh, behind me now. And as John was saying, they cover things like KLF and Timothy Leary, so counterculture, things like that. But also things like Watling Street and a uh, history of the 20th century. Uh, and one of the sort of recurring tropes, as it were, that sort of keeps popping up in all these different books uh, was Blake, uh, because he very much shapes the way, you know, I, I look at things. Uh, and when I'd be writing about whatever it was, 
Blake would often have a great way to sort of, you know, sum it up. So he would, he would appear quite often. But I never really thought I'm going to write a book about Blake. That just seemed a bit too daunting um, until, well, 2019, it was, it was weird, really. It was the best way I can describe it is that when I'm writing a book, I have about four other books, four or five other books sort of cooking in the back of my head, just just slowly, just slowly being thought about. And um, they're very civil. They just sort of wait until I finish a book. And then it's almost like they talk amongst each other. And one of them decides I'm next. And it sort of steps forward. And that's the next book. And um, it's, it's odd, but that's how it always feels. Uh, until 2019, when I was writing away, I had all these books sort of uh, cooking. And suddenly this Blake book just sort of emerged out of nowhere uh, and just said, I'm next. I sort of pushed the others out aside. And it had a real sense of, look, I'm needed now. Um, there's no argument. Uh, and you don't really argue with things like that. Um, so the, the, the Blake book uh, was, was what came next. Uh, this was just before the, uh, the grave marker was unveiled, the Blake Society uh, grave marker at, at Bunhill Fields. So I was talking to a lot of people about Blake at that point. And there was a very recurring um, perspective that was that was appearing. People would say, "Yeah, I love Blake," um, or "I like Blake," or "I recognise that Blake is, you know, one of the important ones," or "He's very much on my side," or something like that. But they wouldn't read him. Um, they wouldn't claim to understand him. They wouldn't really know how to go about doing that. They wouldn't really know why they weren't doing it. Um, for some, it, there was a sense that they felt it would be too hard or too, um, too wrapped up in 18th century things that didn't seem relevant to them, or uh, there was, you know, that they needed permission or, or something like that. Um, it was almost as if Blake was this like uh, astonishing Gothic castle. And they knew that inside there'll be wonders and treasures, but they just couldn't find a way in. Um, they weren't sure if they were allowed in. Uh, and if they wanted to, there just didn't seem to be that entrance. So it was clear to me straight away that that was what a book should be. A book should be attempt to be a way into this, this great sort of castle uh, of, of Blake. And I'm aware, talking to the Blake Society, that that's not none of you lot, because the fact that you're members of the Blake Society shows that you found a way in and um, uh, and, you, and you haven't had that sort of mental uh, block that you just you just have gone in fine. Um, so I'm slightly aware that the book isn't I aimed exactly at you, but I am hoping it's going to sort of create more people who will join the Blake Society <laughs> uh, in, in, in the long run. Um, and um, I put a lot of thought into what was keeping people from reading Blake. Um, Cause that's really what I would like. I would like him to be, I would like his you know, mythology to be a sort of a, a, a shared cultural touchstone that we can, people just reference without thinking about it. And we just expect it to be known and we sort of expect it to be understood. Um, and a, a lot of it came down, I think, to the, the central importance of the idea that the imagination was divine. Uh, and I think for a lot of people, it was just, they just sort of froze at that sort of point. They didn't, they understood the words, but it didn't sort of fit with their perspective on the world or, or their philosophy or how they, they understood it. It, it. it didn't sort of lead on to the next thing. It was, it was, it was, it was something that um, needed to be addressed. And at first I thought it was the divine part of the divine imagination that people in the 21st century were sort of struggling with. And I'm, I'm sure if you were to do a survey and ask people if they had a, a concept of or a relationship with the divine, you know, the, the number that reply in the negative would be quite significant, you know, these days. But the more I worked on it, the more I started to realize that it was actually the imagination that was the tricky thing, 
because it's one of those words that we all go, oh, we know what that is. You know, we all know what imagination is. So we don't really give it any, any thought um, until we do. And when you start to think about what the imagination is, then this whole, you know, rabbit hole just opens up um, in front of you. Uh, and so huge chunks of the book, William Blake versus the world, are attempts at getting people to reassess or re, uh, re to reinterpret imagination, both in general, but also personally, what their imagination is. There's, you know, huge chunks, there's big chunks on Swedenborg and all these sort of things that are really there to make the reader gain a new insight or, or perspective on imagination and particularly their uh, imagination. Um, and an another thing which sort of ties in with this, which I thought was key for me to sort of get this book sort of going was uh, something that, uh, that Blake said to Henry Crabb Robinson uh, on, on the night that they met in 1825 or, or whenever it was. And, and uh, Henry Crabb Robinson asked Blake uh, about the divinity of Christ. And Blake replied, he is the only God, and so am I, and so are you. And I use this right at the start of the book when I, most readers will not understand what Blake's trying to say and raise it again at the end of the book where hopefully they will at that point get it and, and really understand what he will say. Uh, and as, you know, as Blake Society members, um, I'm sure you're all very familiar with the, the way Blake uh, viewed, you know, the the light of Christ within, or, or Jesus uh, with the divine imagination as, as interchangeable um, uh, forces or concepts or whatever. Um, but it was the fact that he said, um, Jesus, the divine imagination, is the only God, and so am I, so to all his sort of creative endeavors and all his work and the, the sort of sheer force and brilliance and wonderfulness of his imagination. Uh, but then he said, and so are you. He didn't say, um, but you're not Henry, you're, you're, you're a long way from, from where we are or anything like that. The notion that the visionary state that Blake had achieved, uh, he, was, he was saying it was for everyone really, it was, it was for this guy he'd just met that he could sort of achieve it, um, was key for me uh, in my understanding of Blake because Blake, you know, he never, he never tried to sort of raise himself up as some like, you know, astonishing giant that was above us that we all had to sort of um, look up at in awe. You know, he never, despite his visions all his life, he never um, presented himself as a guru or, or anything like that. He was always just human. He was always stressing he was human. It was his humanity. Um, and he just wanted everybody else to realize that their, man, that their humanity was much more than they were given it credit for. He wanted other people to realize that about themselves, um, that they, and they too would then see the world in, the, in this sort of visionary state. Um, so that was sort of, those things sort of became the approaches that I took in, in this book. I wanted Blake not to scare people. I wanted him to be a human figure that, that you could relate to. And if, if, you know, if he used to walk in the room, you'd be pleased to see him rather than sort of terrified or, or awestruck or something like that. Whilst at the same time, putting all that sort of awe and wonder and uh, the reactions we get from his work uh, around the imagination around the human imagination and and uh, in it in its in its grandest and most um, am amazing course so that's really what the book is trying to do it's trying to rewrite um, people's perceptions of their own minds and what it's capable of but it's still becoming extremely fond uh, of Blake and uh, that sense that he's on his side and um, I think it's gone quite so far I've touched wood and, and all that um, I've been a bit blown away by the reaction. Um, I think I'm lucky in that the people, you know, the 238,000 people who went to the Tate exhibition, a lot of those sort of came out having seen, been overwhelmed by all that just astonishing work. Uh, and I recognised 
that there's clearly brilliance to Blake and that, that it chimes with them in some way, but not really feeling that they understood what he was about and where he was coming from and sort of the sort of that, that need to sort that, as I say, way in. Um, and uh, it's, I mean, the book, it's officially been out two weeks and it's already been reprinted. So it's, it's going much, much better than I expected, which I, I hope shows um, that there's a desire for Blake. I think I'm right in saying that it's the first book about Blake that's not on an academic imprint or a, you know, a poetry imprint um, for 26 years since Peter Ackroyd's uh, biography, which is just wrong, you know, surely. Uh, hopefully it will show that there is a desire for more books about Blake aimed, you know, at the more general reader, at the, at the, the general population, because we know that 2027 is, is, is coming up, the 200th anniversary of, um, uh, of, of Blake's death. And there's that line, uh, in Jerusalem, where he says every 200 years a door to eternity opens, which for me makes, you know, this 200th anniversary that we're coming up to a very, very sort of special time. And I would love it if Blake was just common in, you know, British culture and, and his mythology and his way of, of, of looking at things. Um, so that's, that's my hopes hopes for the book really uh, I, hope that, I hope that makes sense uh I'll, I'll hand back to john now having said my bit if he's around there i am hello hello thanks very much john that was great um i'm just trying it's a bit like the book itself it, there's so many connections and and it's almost like um neurons connecting to each other it's hard to know where to start and to, and to find yeah. the best way in firstly i just want to say that i am totally here for the idea of you writing a book about blake as a recruitment drive for the blake society that's <laughs> much appreciated yes. <laughs> um i love the idea of blake uh speaking in your ear as it were and and demanding that you write a book about him it yeah. was an insist it was it was the book it wasn't so much blake it was the book and the book was insistent and it the book certainly had uh it had his voice to a certain extent but it, you know I, i'm not saying it was it was definitely the book itself that was just demanding to yeah. exist it reminds me slightly of the the um of milton you know coming down mm. as a star and like landing in um blake's book <laughs> did you have any pains yeah. in the book the day that that occurred no, I, it, I didn't. But I, that's one of the things I just love about Blake is that he just landed on his foot. That's funny to me. I, you know, I know there's, uh, there's all the symbolism involved in it and the, the, the foot being the lowest part of the body, which is part of the soul. And it's how we enter the vegetal world. And I see all that side to it. But it's still funny. Um, and, and things like uh, Marriage of Heaven and Hell, when he's just sort of having a conversation with an angel, the, he can be very, very, very funny very appealing i agree i think this the one thing that uh it's a bit like um radiohead or something like that it, it mm. sort of goes sort of unquestioned that it's all incredibly serious but i think <laughs> the side to play, particularly in the marriage of heaven and hell where he's he's sort of uh having a bit of a pop and uh and he knows he's being subversive and he's and he's sort of uh uh yeah he's 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 trying to be funny and um provocative yeah. There's, a, there's a sense of delight to it. He's taking delight in doing it. Yeah. I really like. Um, I wanted to go back to uh, your, uh, you talking about Henry Crabb Robinson and starting the book with him because um, there's a really lovely little uh, uh, detail that Henry Crabb Robinson, when he's writing up his, um, his meetings with Blake, he says something like, um, isn't it funny that I'm drawn to, to mystics? Mm. And uh, mm. even though, what does he say? I who have no imagination, mm. which is quite, there's some, something slightly sad about that. But also, as, as you were saying, it's one of the things that I love about Blake is that, is that it's about uh, a spiritual quest or, or um, it's religious in, in a broad sense. Sure. But it's not, um, it's not doffing your cap to God. It's, it's, it's sort of... Um, Republican in that sense, and and I think that ties in with what you're saying about the the potential for to to be God or to recognise God in all of us. It's it's the recognition that all this is internal, uh, that, that all deities reside in the in the human breast, 
that um, what we're taught, uh, you know, heaven, hell, God, angels, demons, we're sort of taught of them as out of there somewhere, it's sort of exterior, somewhere where we can't necessarily reach, you know, heaven, you're not going to get it in this life, mate, maybe after you die, you can, you can sort of get there. Uh, and um, Blake just denies all this. He just, he's just very, very clear that, uh, although it looks without, it is within, um, that the spiritual, the, the immaterial, the, the, um, and all the, the angels and all of the, the characters and all the things that live in that sort of realm are inside us and are a product of this, this divine imagination. Um, and that, A, lifts us up and stops us being subservient to sort of some, some, some greater thing uh, on top, but also takes away a level of reverence, rever rever reverence, I'm trying to say, mm. reverence, I guess. It's, it's like when he, um, the angel Gabriel uh, comes to him and uh, uh, when he's, he's, he's reading, is it night? And, uh, he's, he's reading some book, an angel Gabriel uh, turns up uh, and he's not sort of like, oh, it's angel Gabriel. It's just like, oh, oh, it's you, is it? And he tries to, you know, check that it's really him and test him out in case he's trying to uh, trick him. You know, he, he, um, he viewed the, the, you know, the imagination uh, as, as utterly divine, as I say, and as, as utterly worthy of reverence. Um, but the things within it, you know, he was, he was, he, he was, he was equally valid to them. He was, he was on par with them. Mm. Um, you know, we weren't sort of sniveling worms in, in the dust uh, ahead of these celestial beings. Um, they, you know, we were, we could look them in the eyes with Blake. I love the idea of, it's a bit like the gas man coming round and sort of checking his credentials. <laughs> are you in fact the angel? All right, okay, all right, maybe you are, yeah. yeah. Uh, that kind of ties in with, with visions that, and the idea of Blake having visions that I wanted to talk to you about. I learnt a lovely word, which I think is noetic. Yeah. From your, from your book and, and writing about that. Could you, could you tell us a bit more about your thoughts about Blake's experience of, of visions and also how that relates to his idea of uh, self-annihilation? Oh yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, well, um, I mean, the thing with Blake's visions is that he had them throughout his entire life from very early childhood and, until his, you know, his last, days and months um, and that rules out a lot of ways that they've been sort of explained or even dismissed you know in the, in the 60s there was a, a real sense that uh, he had psychedelic mushrooms or, or that, was, that was the common belief because there was so much similarity between uh, the experiences that he was recounting and the, the, what people were having um, with the the drug culture at the time I think we've moved past all that I think don't think anyone believes that anymore uh, it was, um, uh, he was achieving states of mind that are s similar to, or the same, the same as those recorded across times, across cultures. Uh, and it wasn't really until you got William James's The Variety of Religious Experiences in the early 20th century that looked at these experiences as experiences. Uh, and sort of stripped them of their sort of cultural context because people always interpret them within the, the understandings of the culture of the time. Um, and he was looking at the similarities between them um, uh, of all these different accounts, from all these different cultures, from all these uh, different across centuries. And the, the sense of them being ineffable was uh, probably the key one, but also that this, this sense of being noetic, that they were filled with information. Uh, not informate uh, too much information, just utter utter blast um, of um, knowledge. Um, I, I, I talk about Rousseau in, in the book um, because Rousseau was always sort of listed as one of the architects of the Age of Enlightenment and sort of portrayed as this you know, rationalist figure. But he too had this visionary experience uh, when he was just left weeping under a tree. And all his life, all his books were attempts to communicate what he'd experienced in, in, the, in that sort of brief half hour period. And he said he'd only managed to get across a fraction, a fraction of you know what he got into during this sort of this sort of this sort of vision. Um, so yeah, so it's important to put Blake's visions in this um, 
in this form of context. What was the what was the last? There was a second part to your question, John. Sorry. Oh, about um, because you relate uh, the particularly his experience of visions to his idea of um, his phrase of self annihilation. Yes. Yes. Definitely. Um, this this is the notion that um, the loss of a sense of self is an integral part um, to uh, these vision states. Um, there seems to be an increasing amount of, of evidence for it. It certainly comes from the worlds of like med meditation and, and things like that. That sense where your brain um, has constructed this, this narrative, this story of you that has a past and a, and a future. Uh, and um, when that sort of dissolves, when there's no you, there's sort of no sort of boundary between you and the universe. You know, it's 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 a um, it's a, it's a union, uh, and it's very very common in all descriptions of religious experiences. This this sort of dropping of, of sort of boundaries, this this uh, of um, of no longer being sort of confined. When uh, uh, and he, it, you see it in Blake's writing quite a lot. I come to self annihilation, and he stresses that. And annihilation and death is not the same thing. It's the, it's not physical death. It's the it's the construct in our minds. Essentially, it's Eurism. Eurism has constructed this sort of rational model of the world and yourself. Yourself really being a you know a story. Um, uh, and various parts of the uh, uh, the brain are now recognised as sort of forming uh, this sort of thing. And through various you know, practices or, or ways or drugs or whatever, when that's weakened, uh, the sort of the, the, the walls fall really. And, and there's the, the sense that there's a separation between you and the universe and that just, just falls away. And it's, you know, it's quite blissful because there's no worries about the future or guilt about the past, all those the part of the story of yourself, which you've stopped, stopped telling you. It's just, um, just, uh, it's just a, a physical moment. I, t I talk in the book about uh, a neuroscientist called Jill Bolt Taylor, um, who experienced a stroke and was able to observe what was was happening thanks to uh, her, her training. Her stroke was in the in the left hemisphere, uh, and when she lost that, the the rest of the brain uh, that was much more uh, holistic and and linked to the body and to, to emotions and things like that, rather than rational thought and language and meaning thought. She was suddenly aware uh, of ways of conscious experience that had been drowned out by this chattering monkey that, that we all sort of have. And it, it was bliss, you know, and it, you know, it was, um, obviously having the stroke and having to rebuild a life was, was difficult, but because the experience itself was so positive, you know, the way she writes about it is, is really fascinating. And, yeah. and you can look at people like I mentioned Eckhart Tolle, um, who wrote The Power of Now, uh, and he talks about, he was in such a, a bad point of his life, uh, he ba it basically gave up, it was despair almost, uh, and he just, it's almost like he stopped caring about himself, and the, the sense of self just fell away. And the, this this sort of light of of uh, ourselves just replaced it, and that's what a lot of his books and a lot of his sort of spiritual sense is. This sort of when the van when the sense of self vanishes, um, we're aware of everything else, and and um, uh, and it's and when you're conscious of these things and you go back and read Blake, many many times you go he's he's explaining it perfectly. He's explaining it, but the, the thing that Blake has a reputation of being difficult until you understand him, and then you realise just how clear he's being, you know, and, and how perfectly he's sort of explaining these things. Um, yes. So. I, think, I think in the, the same chapter as you bring in those uh, examples, and this is one of the things that I think is really interesting about the book is, as you say, it's not, um, it's not an academic book about mm. Blake, and, and it sure. means you can that's not the objective. So you can bring in uh, seemingly sort of far-flung disciplines to, to try and illuminate um, aspects of Blake and and sometimes vice versa. I think in the same chapter, you you, um, you bring in those examples, there's uh, 
there's a really lovely letter you mentioned from Einstein. Yes. Uh, where he's mm -hmm. writing to um, the family of a, a recently bereaved family of a, a mm -hmm. colleague of his who's passed away. And he, he very poorly paraphrase it. He, he more or less says, oh, I'm very sorry for your loss. Um, of course, time's not real, mm -hmm. so you know, don't worry. Um, but it reminded me quite a lot of the letter that Blake wrote to um, William Haley when his oh. son died and he's similarly yes, sort of offering yes. commiseration in a way that says, well, yeah. the way you think the universe is, it's not, so it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was a beautiful letter. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, because uh, it isn't, you know, it's not an academic book. It's, you know, it's shocking pink with yellow circles on the front. You know? <laughs> it's, it's, it doesn't even have a subtitle. It's, it's you know, it's, it's you know, Trying to make that sort of clear. Um, the thing um, I found, uh, the thing that sort of made me feel I was able uh, and uh, allowed to write about Blake was actually, I was reading a lot of, of books about him and I'd read Witness Against the Beast and I'd read uh, Why Mrs. Blake Cried and I'd read um, the God of the Left Hemisphere. And those books were just so different that the, the, the notion that they're all about the same person just mm. seemed so extraordinary. And it became very, very clear to me that Blake was just such a multifaceted, um, brilliant mind that whenever anyone approaches him, uh, they're going to get a very sort of, they're going to find their own interests in there. Uh, and their own, um, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll find what they're looking for themselves. So everyone has a sort of personal Blake, which is in some way a bit of a, uh, a self-portrait. You, you, mm. you find what you want in there. Um, and because everyone does that, that sort of, that makes it okay. It means that everyone can, can do that. And I felt that I was able to then go and write a book, which would be my version of, of Blake or how he appears to me. Uh, using the, the things that interest me and the, the references and the cultural things that uh, help illuminate him to me, yeah. uh, knowing that that's the only way these these things can ever be. Because I think, um, you know, Blakeians, uh, what's what's great about them is that uh, there's, they don't, tell, or, or usually don't, um, have this sense that there's this one correct vision of Blake. And if they have this one way of seeing him, um, they want everyone else to agree with them and, and, you know, and force people to see it that way. And if someone has a different take, then they, they must be fought and they're wrong. That sort of fundamentalist sort of thing. Most Blakeians will see that as going, oh, that's you as an entering his dragon form. They sort of know exactly what that is. Uh, and it's like every different perspective on Blake is kind of nice. You know, it is, is kind of useful. And I love those events where people sort of get together or, you know, on, on Blake walks or something like that. And now, now McDevitt's Blake walks were just brilliant for this. Mm. People will just come together and they've all got their own particular version of Blake about what's drawn them to it. And you just sort of stop talking and you, you know, it's just helpful to see all these, these other ones. They're all really sort of interesting. Um, that's it's odd, isn't it? Because you, you'd sort of, like, I completely agree, people find, stuff in in Blake that is that is important to them or, or particularly them as you say that Blake and you would expect that perhaps in a in an artist who was a bit um <sighs> vaguer or or sort of <laughs> more amorphous yeah so um yeah for want of a better word sort of outspoken and and um like we said provocative in places and and mm. but but that definitely happens is it, it seems to be a Every, quality of it. everything's in there it's it's i, I think it's because of the, the importance of contraries of, of opposites you know there's often you get that sense of blake that he's sort of outside of reality sort of looking in and hence he sees everything and he doesn't just you know favor this and talk about that he includes you know heaven and hell he talks of the marriage of heaven and hell you can have one you can't have one without the other so he includes them both so he pretty much includes everything it's the it's the it's the um it's it's the most it's the broadest mind that i think i've ever you know encountered mm. that probably it's one of the things i wanted to ask you about uh so 
one of the things your book emphasizes is that is that the uh particularly when you get onto the the later stuff um Forzoas and, and Milton and Jerusalem uh is that the the sort of mythological soap opera of the of the four Zoas is one of the things it is 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 a sort of dramatization or uh, a depiction of um uh human consciousness really mm -hmm. and also like what's gone wrong with human consciousness yeah um i guess what i'm asking is could you elaborate on that yeah i mean it was it was this was a real shock to me because it was quite late that i actually got round to reading the the four zoas i i I, I think that's normal i think that's yeah. quite common isn't it um i'd sort of put it off for a while and i had a, a the, the sort of this general background sense i'd had of blake uh which i think was pretty much certainly how he was viewed in like the 1960s in that sort of cultural cultural context was that it was about eurozone is bad mm. but loss or orthona or the creative thing is what will defeat him eurozone um, was, was the man yeah basically yeah. he was the man and, and <laughs> uh, creativity and art and uh, uh we'll 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 see us right in the end so when i finally got and read the four zoas um it was a little bit of a shock to see that it wasn't that you know it, it wasn't a case of eurism being overthrown and and uh, loss or, or athona taking his crown it was just all the four zoas just just coming into balance and then they all have this big feast and then sweet science reigns you know it wasn't wasn't sweet art or sweet religion it was sweet science which at the time i take just understanding of the um uh, of the of the world um and it was um and 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 eurism was valued as long as you don't fall if somebody doesn't believe it uh, that his limited model of the world is the world that once long as you can get outside of that as you can see the world from outside of eurism then he's very very necessary and he's very very useful and you know we're we're communicating in language and writing books and you know and blake was which is using the part of our brains that is eurism to, to get ideas across uh we need him we need him we just need for him to be aware that there's stuff outside of the model that that he's created um and both the four zoas and i mean it's the same myth really the, the the albion myth it always ends with that awakening which is the, the four zoas forming yeah. back into, into into balance and um then the, that, that great divine sort of light um uh comes through and i and i realized uh just recently that you know in in the um the ancient of days when eurism is leaning out of this this golden orb um which he can't see he's, he's concentrating on creating this this finite rational world with his, his compass and he can't say this divine light of the imagination sort of behind him um in glad day or albion rose or you know that that, that one um there's the same light behind him but the character is aware of it it's almost like he's bathing in this light behind him you know it's 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 and it's almost like it's rushing sort of through him um and that's the sort of sense of the mind uh as it should be, you know, that's the visionary state that uh, he's desperately trying to achieve, uh, or that he that he knows we can all achieve, that he, mm. that should be allowed to us. And an old friend of mine used to say, um, you know, we've got to stop fucking around. Paradise is our birthright. He used <laughs> to say, uh, and that's always stuck with me. And, and I know he got that from Blake. That sense of how things should. Oh. I'm having a horrible fear that my connection has been unstable at the moment. Are you okay? I was, you I was wondering me? whether it was me or you. So yeah, <laughs> it sounds like it might be your end. Let's uh, let's persevere anyway. <laughs> you see, you seem to be back now. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I hope it's I hope it's clear anyway. Oh, it might be my end. Who knows? More or less inevitable. Um, you you use the phrase I think in the last chapter, uh, Blake's diagnosis, which I think is is what you've just described really. Um, I love the idea of like Blake being this wacky doctor you're going to see and, and being a little bit surprised at the treatment you get. But you do have um, quite <laughs> specific, um, uh, and I guess this is again to do with it not being um, 
not being an academic book, but it but it can do this. It, you have some fairly specific ideas about lessons we could take from Blake to improve ourselves or the world or human consciousness. Um, what are they? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that, I mean, it's it's that's basically what I got from reading Blake. That's what he seemed to be sort of telling me, um, and I. I I chuck them in the pot and see if they, you know, uh, work with with other people. But it's it's basically what we were just talking about. It was it's the basically that once you get the four zoas into balance, um, then the world can become golden, as he was saying. You know, then it's uh, you can see London as Jerusalem. Um, then you you have access to this this. Um, it's almost it's almost like. I mean, we don't really use the word soul very much in the 21st century. We don't sort of talk of people's soul. But the way that Blake is talking about things like heaven and hell as, as internal states, um, it, it kind of brings it back. He, and he is sort of talking about the state of your soul. And, and you know, the state of your soul is the thing with it, you've got to live with it, basically. You know, you, you only have a very short period on this planet. You know, we have our 80 years if we're lucky or, or something like that. And you can, you know, go around seeing uh, nothing but sort of bleakness and despair or something, or you can see it with, with a more Blakean eyes. So that, that great quote that I think John Balance from Coyle used in a, in a letter to John, uh, Julian Cope, uh, why be bleak when you can be Blake? You know, he's, he's He's, he's very much aware that there's a moral component to perception, that how you see the world is as much a reflection as you, um, as it is about the world. Um, as a man is, so he sees, as he, as he, as he, as he put it so beautifully in that, in that uh, letter to uh, Reverend Tussler. Uh, and it's an, uh, that's an idea that I've used quite a bit because it's appeared in my books about Robert Anton Wilson, and it's appeared appeared in my books about Timothy Leary, um, this notion that uh, the world as you perceive it is to an extent, you know, a Rorschach Inkblot test, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's as much down to us as it is, is to the world. And you know what it's like if you're sort of tired or hungover and like everyone's very, very irritating. Uh, and you convince yourself that that's what it is. You convince yourself people are very, very irritating. If, if you stop and think about it, the extent to which that's you, seeing you know your state reflected back at yourself um is 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 a tough one and that that idea as i say because it's been so many of, of my books not not by blake but uh, uh, by other people as a man is so he sees it's fascinating because the reaction to it it's usually very positive people see it as a as a really helpful insight um yeah. and they see it as liberating in, in some way uh, most people do, but there's a small fraction of people who are just aghast, you know, and absolutely horrified um, that, that they may have any responsibility for their worldview. Because it's very easy to sort of fall into a worldview where you just go, well, people are terrible, you know, and we're all, we're all fucked. That's a very seductive, simple, easy worldview to sort of fall, fall into. Yeah. Um, and, you Actually know, reading Blake sorry I was just gonna say that it sort of ties in with the, with all the kind of um locky and stuff about sense information of the like you like the idea that you're passive that you have no ability or responsibility mm. to to what you do with that stuff um yeah there's there's a there's a chapter in the book where you deal with um uh Blake's mental health and it's striking as well that he uses that phrase in, in one of one of the um, the poems in the notebook that you quote. He uses the phrase mental health, which mm -hmm. um, but that seems to me to tie in with what you were just saying, because because it's not, you know, everyone the, the, the myth of him being mad because he saw things. The, the point in his life in which he seemed to be suffering quite poor mental health was to do with how he was kind of right to in a way because things were bloody awful for him you know yeah, yeah. everyone was employing him and everyone was ignoring him and and you know he should have been 
people should have been interested in him and, and they weren't and that is dispiriting and depressing and he became mm. uh, yeah perhaps a little paranoid and and irascible and and depressed but um but that kind of ability to 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 transform your world of view and and responsibility perhaps to do so so it ties in with um an idea that i think you you pose that one of the things the the big the big final poems are is is almost a sort of act of um uh art self-therapy like that he sort of uses them somehow to find uh, a more yeah it's it's uh, it's striking the descriptions of him after he's finished writing those poems to him, say in around 1809, when he's mm. having the, um, uh, the exhibition, how, how different he sort of comes across. And I think we're very much at the stage now, in, in the you know, 2020s, where we can like talk about Blake having a period of poor mental health and in no way feel that that stigmatizes him or diminishes mm. his work or how we react to his work. Um, I'm, I'm always struck by the difference between uh, Blake and Van Gogh, and that Van Gogh scholars are just very casual about uh, Vincent's mental health, and you know it was added to the story, and they they were interested in it, and it was part of it. I think because his mythology was so off-putting and confusing to people, um, and because he was dismissed as mad, there was always a tendency to go, no, no, he's definitely not mad. You know, you should read him, and once you get into him, you'll see that how sane he is. And you know, I, I totally agree. Some of the saner sort of uh, stuff is there. So there may have been a tendency not to want to talk about. Um, it's really that period from the late 1990s onwards when there's there's the first reference to um, melancholy. He's fallen into a pit of melancholy, uh, a, and he's um, a melancholy for no reason a disease which God keep you and all good men from, or something like that, he says. And the, the, the fact that he's referring to melancholy or depression, as we now say, his disease was way ahead of its time. Mm. You know, it, it really was. Um, and then there's sort of very strong mood swings for a period and certainly paranoia um, in the early 1800s were, were, were seen. But, you know, after that, he, he there's none of that sort of stuff. That's not how he's described at all. And in his early years, that you wouldn't say anything like that. It was just he had a tough period, um, and I, you know, I think that's fine to sort of recognise now. Yeah, yeah. I should, um, I should open you up, as it were, to others. Hmm. So uh, I think it's that time. Yeah. Um, if people want to um, turn their cameras on, so we can see you. And then I think what we'll do is um, to, uh, if people can um, use the um, raising the hand little button thingy to uh, to ask a question, then I think you'll pop up and I can uh, invite you to, to talk to Charles. Uh, apologies in advance for pronouncing everyone's names wrong. Um, okay. John, you'll get that one right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll pretend that you're all the names of Zoas and it doesn't matter. Uh, we've got a question from Ramazan. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful um, conversation you had because lots of things lit up in my mind. Mm -hmm. Especially, I loved your simile uh, when you said Blake is like a gothic castle with uh, treasures inside. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that is an absolutely beautiful uh, simile because uh, when I try to explain Blake or talk about Blake, people uh, are aware that he is something uh, awesome, someone awesome, mm. but they fear to tread uh, deeper into that territory. So, um, um, but I feel that once you get to know him, he won't let you just stay where you are. He pushes you to take the journey deeper into yourself and deeper into the perception of the world. So, yeah, he he very much wanted. If we go with that metaphor, he wanted you to come into that castle. Yeah, those those lines in Jerusalem that are on his on his grave marker. I give you the end of a golden string, mm -hmm. only wind it into a ball. It will lead you into heaven's gate, built in Jerusalem's wall. You know, he just wants us to follow this thread in, into his way. Uh, of perceiving um, and his that's what his work is there for and it's it's just 
frustrating that people feel they can't read it or they can't sort of go to it or they can't they don't have a, a framework to sort of slot it in and understand it really that's really that's what I've been hoping to sort of try and provide. And when you talk uh, John Riordan talk about uh, pain of late and portraying it and a sublimation of of sorts I was thinking of Van Gogh because of Doctor Who and the dialects behind you <laughs> because of uh, in a Vincent episode if you remember um, the curator of the museum was talking about Van Gogh and he said pain is easy to portray uh, but to use your passion and pain to portray the ecstasy and joy and magnificence of our world so I think they apply to Blake as well. It yeah. directly applies to Blake as well. And you said that as well. And my question was actually, thank you for all of this. Um, have you read Ramta? Ramta, the white book or the white book of Ramta? I have not, no. Okay. Should I? Uh, I? I read that five years or six years ago before I began reading Blake deeply. Yeah. And I didn't quite grasp that. I thought of it. Um, not too relevant, but then I read Blake and then read, read it again. And um, he, I want to say he says exactly what Blake wants to say in his mental drama uh, in simpler words, but that simpler uh, open explanation does not quite satisfy you as Blake's mental drama does. Okay, okay, I've made, I've made a note, that does sound good. Blake, um has the advantage of just being such a brilliant poet and painter that he was able to, um, it was like what we were talking earlier about uh, in William James' variety of religious experiences, the, the, the notion that the ineffable nature of these experiences is a constant through, throughout history. People can't even begin to explain what they've sort of been, been through. Um, but Blake came closest because of the poetry and, and the paintings and the, the way he could exp express what was inside him in a way that when you see his work, you go, oh, right, these, 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 this is real stuff, isn't it? This is, I, I believe you, I believe you, William Blake. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, very, very lucky to have had such a talented, creative person yeah. trying to express these, these things to us. Yeah, in Ramta, uh, you will see many parallels with Blake's words, almost uh, word by word parallels. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Thank huh? you for um, your presentation and thank you for the book. I'm looking forward to reading that. Thanks, thanks very much. Thanks for your question. I was just going to self indulgently jump in there for a moment, the self indulgent writer of the compare, and say I think part of the thing with Blake is that if it was, a, if it was an essay, explaining uh, what he was on about, the, the, the framework of his uh, thought, it, it would only appeal to the kind of Eurozenic side of us. Yeah, it's, it's like you have to go through the sort of rewiring experience of reading like Milton or Jerusalem. Yeah. It's almost a bit like um, the end of 2001 where he's in the, the psychedelic space tunnel thing. And it just goes on and on and on and it sort of does something to you and you're not quite but it's it's a it's a sort of a, a sensational experience as well as an intellectual one definitely i mean he is using eurism to show you the limits of eurism yeah your eurism understand that they're just this small part of, of, of something much larger uh and uh it takes quite a creative uh brilliant person to to do that and that's exactly what he was yeah. Right. I think uh, Salvo was next with a question. Yes. Uh, good evening. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Salvo. Uh, Thank you, John, for this uh, brilliant presentation. I was uh, I, I really enjoyed when you said uh, about the shock in reading the four Zoas that changes the perspective uh, from uh, the uh, uh, reason versus loss, uh, reason versus emergence, uh, towards a, a scenery which is uh, more complex. Yeah. And I, I always fancied that the fact that the four Zoas vanished and was retrieved 
at the, at the, at the, at the end of the uh, 20th century yeah. and at the beginning of the 21st century. And it, it is because it, it portrays, and it's not the case, because it portrays the fragmentation of uh, the, the, the present uh, uh, humanity. And it's a sort of message to, 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 to improve imagination in order to, uh, to, to resolve this fragmentation, to, uh, to, to act uh, creatively uh, in order to, to put all the things together. So it's a message for, for, the, for the contemporary humanity. Yeah, and I, I, I think it has a reputation of being one of the hardest things to read which I don't think it is. I, th I think it's an easier read than Jerusalem. I think we're just, um, I'm lucky it's not in the, you know, the Penguin complete poems, which is that sort of many people will have. They can read Milton in that, they can read Jerusalem, but I think I'm right in saying the Four Zones isn't in, uh, in that book, which is, it's a real sort of shame because it's, it's such a key important part of, um, of certainly my understanding of Blake now. Uh, so I realised that I've got a cat I'm trying to just break into the, uh, <laughs> the room. Sorry about that. But yeah, I mean, I'd certainly, certainly encourage anyone who's yet to read <laughs> this. Uh, anyone who's yet to read the four zones, it's just a dive in. I think I think it's great. It was lovely seeing the, the start of this um, this Zoom call, the, those scrolling pages. Uh, was it that Stephen had done of, of, of the handwritten sort of unfinished sort of thing? That was that was really lovely. Yeah, we should say thank you to thank Steve you. And, and Ian who are who are behind the scenes uh, but are responsible for the, the smooth running and that beautiful introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Salvo. Uh, I think we've got Andy with a question next. Yeah, hi. So um as a member of the Blake Society, I'm very excited and happy that everybody loves Blake because they really do, and it's hard to find people who don't, you know. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that, you know, everybody likes Blake. So from, I saw the, um, a history of the fascist English Defence League recently mm -hmm. uh, being sold and, and it's written under the pseudonym Billy Blake because they might want to identify with Blake as well. Mm -hmm. So you have, and, and so, and, and that relates to something you said about how everybody has their different Blake, and Blake, Blake is multifaceted, like Odysseus, he's a man of many ways. And mm -hmm. I, I kind of agree with that, but I also think that part of the problem isn't that he's got many, many different interests, and he's spread thinly, so to say, but that Blake's way of looking at the world is so antithetical to most people's way of looking at the world. Mm -hmm. And so you get people who look at him and they try and ignore things that are actually cent central to him because it doesn't fit their perception. Mm -hmm. And that happens a lot with his politics. You know, people like to write about him as a mystic and, 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 and write off his politics. When in fact, to me, these are completely inseparable things. Mm -hmm. And with that regard, you know, I, I read your book with great excitement. I've been looking forward to reading it for a long time because I knew you were going to come at it from a non academic point of view. Nothing wrong with an academic point of view, of course, but it's nice to see fresh light um, shed on Blake, new perspectives. Mm -hmm. But I did have, I thought that in terms of the main themes you addressed, you've addressed uh, one of them in particular tonight about the Blake's idea of the centrality of the imagination. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I agreed with everything you said about that, you know, in the sense its importance, its centrality to Blake. The problem with it is if you're trying to relate Blake to a contemporary audience, actually in the visual arts and in poetry, it's easy to talk about the imagination without really making any difference and I, I, what I mean by that is that if you go to the Tate Modern you can see pictures by great revolutionary artists and um, by that I mean people who weren't just revolutionary as artists they were revolutionaries the Dardis the mm -hmm. Surrealists but it's all made very anodyne by being taken out of its context and you know and it, it becomes possible for you know I don't know the leaders of the Tory party to invest in the white cube and see themselves as at the center of modern art, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Saatchi and so on and so forth. It's because the political context which made the art so vibrant is missing. And in that sense, I did think there was a problem with your book because one of the main themes that sort of threads throughout it is, is Blake's idea of um, contraries, 
and the negations and the contraries can subsist and so on and so on. I don't need to tell you what you said in the book, but anyone who knows about, you know, that part of Blake knows is a really key concept sure. in his work. And I thought that the way you played that, I, I just sort of disagreed with, you know, the, um, the, 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 the press release for the book talked about how Britain is a divided nation with, you know, but on the other hand, the Labour Party supports Blake and they sing Jerusalem and so do the Tory party. So kind of why can't we all get over these contraries, use our imagination to see the other person's point of view and all be friends again. And therefore the image of Blake can unite everyone. And I just thought that was a very radically un-Blakean kind of perspective. And, and I'll, 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 I'll finish momentarily. And I think that the way you ended up there was because you missed out what to me is a vital part of Blake's thought, which is his apocalypticism. He's in a tradition of apocalyptic, mm -hmm. I'll call it Yo Joachimite antinomian rebellion that mm -hmm. wants to see history end. And, and whereas in your book, you talk repeatedly about how we have to keep all of the countries in balance and in check so that everything can go on. That misses out Blake's point of view that Blake didn't want things to go on. He wanted the world as it was to end in a very important sense as a, that's an important part of his apocalyptic Christianity. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, absolutely. That, that apocalyptic uh, revelation is, is also um, uh, a remembering, uh, I think the word, um, it is a sense of enlightenment. It, it, is, it is Albion waking again. It is the old world as you saw it before, is destroyed and this sort of new one sort of come, comes through it. Um, if the stuff about countries, what you quoted from the, the press release, if that was how you thought the book was, um, then I'm sorry if, if it didn't work for you. I don't, I don't, I didn't write the press release. That wasn't sort of where, where I was going uh, with, with that sort of thing. Um, I hope there was enough in the, in the book that made it worthwhile for you anyway, if, if, it, if it didn't stress those particular uh, sort sort of things. Well, absolutely, yes. Yeah. So many, many interesting things in it. I've written a very long review of it online. I started writing review. I ended up writing twenty thousand words. I can so so. Yeah, there was a lot to talk about for sure. I I, I, I suspect you have your own book. You should be writing. <laughs> I think I think that's definitely true. Yeah, no, Andy. Yeah, I'd like to. Uh, <laughs> Um, could we, I think, if I got this in the right order, the next uh, raised hand is from Anise. Hi. Um, it was a great talk. Um, I haven't quite finished your, your book yet, but it's fantastic to actually have someone that talks about the four zoids because that's what I'm writing my PhD on. Um, <laughs> but um, I was actually going to ask about the, sh the shock you talk about when you read specifically about loss in the four zoids because... I read the four Zoas first. I didn't read Milton and Jerusalem and Eurizen. I read Songs of Instant Experience, Marriage of Heaven, Elf, four Zoas. Oh, nice. Um, so I always thought of him as a bit of a villain um, and then was shocked when in everything else he's like the hero. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, one of a better word. So um, I was, yeah, so I was just wondering if, I don't, I don't really know how to phrase it, as if, how did it, because I, I know you've said you came to it like last, which I know a lot of people do. Is, is it, a, mm. for you, was it a very different loss from the other losses? Uh, it was, but it was probably a little bit overshadowed by the difference in the role of Eurism. Um, loss is... For me, he's always been a grafter. He's always been sort of um, toiling away, um, maybe slightly humorously. And there's still that sort of element sort of to him in that. But the notion that um, he's not necessarily the main hero in that particular narrative. Um, yeah, that, that wasn't too strange for me. That I, that, that I was... Um, it, was, it wasn't just him in particular, it was just the, the, the shifting of all those different characters into, into that particular sort of framework. Was this, yeah. sort of, it was how they, it was the, 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 with Blake, it's always the dynamics between these characters. You know, he'll take this character and put it against that one to see the dynamic, you know, yeah, that's the, uh, uh, that's the power in that. And so they, 
they were all in um, in a way that felt a different setup, although it was still them. You know, it was still them. Uh, I think I think I'd seen enough of characters that were villains in some of Blake's writings being the heroes in other other right you probably make a case for orc for that and you can see yeah. it with viewers and um yeah it was it was the overall it was the overall yeah, it's, thing it's, i always feel sorry <laughs> i always just feel that there's things lost does in the four zoes that you can't forgive him for like in the other the other poems you can forgive him for a lot and yeah. there's stuff in the four zoes you can't forgive him for Any, anything in particular in these off the top of my head yeah. I've, sorry, I've been working sorry, on your reason. So, <laughs> so like, yeah. Um, it's just that I know he chains Orc in a lot of them, but it seems like the mm -hmm. chaining of Orc in the Four Zoas is horrific. Yeah. Compared to, um, especially the, like the, the Lambeth properties. He's just yeah. so, has not a care for anything else. And I think because he's usually the hero, more heroic. Yeah. Um, you don't want to let him get away with doing these horrific things. Yeah. Yes, I, I think Does that, that makes sense. It, it had in other places been portrayed as necessary, mm -hmm. necessary to sort of uh, bind orc uh, in, in, in those ways. And it, yes, I see what you mean. I do see what you mean. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Anise, do you think that's one of the reasons um, he couldn't make it work in the end? Like the, the the, the four zoas was, was ultimately abandoned. Um, I think square that circle. I I think it's one of the reasons. Um, orc, I believe, is last used in the four zoas. It's the last time um, orc as a character is used, and in like night the seventh, we have Eurizen take his role in the other version, um, and Eurizen orc become like one character rather than being. It's orc very much disappears after the seventeen nineties, really. Doesn't yeah, it? and the four zoas so, are back began at the end of the 1790s so he was still a character but yeah. as as the uh, you know the reign of terror swept through paris and there's the blood washed through the streets and, and things like that like definitely sort of backs away from from orc yeah it's um i think i think it's he, he as a person really changes in the time before zoe is written um yeah. and the poem he can't keep up with the his change in the poem so he just mm. writes a new one instead yeah yeah. Thank you very much. Lovely to meet you, Anise. Thank you. So I think the next raised hand is Emma. Hi. Hi, Hi John. Hi. Hello. Um, I love the, ti love the title of your book. Great title. Yeah, thank you. I, was, I, really I, like, I like that myself. Love that. Yes. <laughs> So um, my question is, as you've been, you know, you obviously studied so much of Blake and really got to know him in his works. After that studying, did you, do you feel that Blake's visions were real or only a product of his imagination? Well, both, <laughs> essentially. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would, I would class, but I would class products of his imagination is real a different kind of real you know you couldn't sell it on ebay or you know sit on it or you know put it out in the garden or something like that um so a different kind of real to most sort of physical things but entirely valid absolutely entirely valid um i, I was talking a bit about uh this is this is a conversation yesterday about um the way that blake wrote about how all the deities reside in the human breast and things like um, uh, heaven and hell are, are states, states of mind, states of consciousness, and how people might not really believe that hell is a real place, a real physical place that has a location that you could go to or you could be sent to. And a lot of people don't believe that in the 21st century, but we've all known someone who at some point has been living in hell, you know, and we know that to deny that experience uh, would be wrong. You know, that's very real and sort of very, very valid. You could argue that's all we have really or, or in, in, in ter internal experiences. Um, so yeah, I, I would, I would, I would. I that's mean, fine. 
that's fine by me. I, I believe they were real, actually. Yeah. So I find myself an outsider most of the times because for I me, mean, that was his, that he's he's um because because I I I'm a poet and I, and I paint. So for me, to feel that they could be real is not it's not that difficult for me to make that leap. Yeah. yeah. To another world. So for me, if you do feel that they're real, it it creates a whole paradigm shift when how you look at William Blake to me because for me his genius was that he did see into another world and um he saw what others didn't and that was his genius he saw into another world and that's why he's so hard to explain and I mean for me I'm always very sad when people say he oh, even discuss was he mad you know that doesn't even come on my radar that you you would think of him is insane. Um, I don't know what it's like to be insane, but I can assume you don't write such a body of works as William Blake. So just as Van Gogh, who I'm also a fan of, I know he had his episodes. I, I understand that he suffered with mental health issues, but the works that he did, the genius that he did, obviously, if, if you're really truly insane, you, you can't create anything. So um, for me, I just was curious if, if you felt that about him, the magic I, stardust of Blake, I feel it. Definitely, yeah. I think for a lot of people, the stumbling block is, is the word word real, which is often defined in very sort of physical. Sure. Terms. I think if you use the word valid and genuine, you know. Uh, and, genuine? Uh, no, it's, as, it's as good a word. That's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. There's that other lovely story, which Thank I, you, I Emma. Thank you. Um, mentioned in your book, John, where... Uh, Blake, I think when he was quite elderly, was talking to a, a, a woman and, and describing um, seeing this sort of beautiful uh, pastoral scene with um, sheep. And then I can't quite remember what happens to make it seem a bit more um, unearthly. But she said, oh, that, that's wonderful. Where, where can I become that? Away. Yeah. And he, and he says, where, where, did, where was this? And he just says, up here. It's like it's, yeah, it's there, but it's, it doesn't mean it's not real. Um, I think, uh, yeah, um, I mean, oh, sorry, carry on. No, no, go, no, go on. Next, next question. I'll oh. just rabbit you for hours, John. <laughs> We've got a, a, another John, a third John, who wants to ask a question. Hello, John. Hi, John. Hi, John oh. and John. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we need to go on a road trip and have adventures. <laughs> <laughs> the three Johns would be a good name for a band. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got my pyjamas on because I had to set my alarm here for six o'clock this morning in New Zealand. Oh, bless you for doing so. Yeah, well, thank you, I was really you. looking forward to it because, um, look, I don't actually have a question because um, I don't have a question, but I wanted to say hi because I, um, until last year, worked for Wellington Library. Mm -hmm. We have all your books and I recommended you were probably the author I recommended for contemporary readers more than anyone else. Well, thank you so much. That's amazing. Well, I really wanted to like thank you because um, personally, um, I was influenced by William Blake very early in life mm -hmm. when I started my travels back in the 70s. Um, William Blake was doing the rounds along with Herman Hess, yeah. Aldous Huxley, yeah. You know, he was recognised as a visionary then. Um, I haven't read your book yet and I'm really looking forward to it because William Blake has always uh, been an influence in my life, but I've never, apart from um, Why Mrs Blake Cried, sure. which I really enjoyed, um, mm. I haven't really read anything that's tried to just pull it apart a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I was very influenced by his... Um, uh, songs of Innocence and Experience, whereby he said that the path is from innocence through experience back to true innocence. And now at my age, I really understand that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And that second innocence is fantastic place and something to really worth aiming for. And it is only through experience you can reach that, which is what I've discovered now um, only the descriptions of blake in old age is such a there's always a childlike quality is mentioned there's the, the delight he had in just playing with children and uh, 
and teaching them to paint and, and uh, uh, just this, this joy in life and people coming together and uh, the, the, the old age Blake uh, is so different to the sort of middle-aged slightly hectoring version that, that we sort of see so coming through back to that sort of sense of sense of innocence was uh, that's and, right and that that kind of potential peace and understanding that a, a, it also reminds me Herman Hess wrote a short story called Iris mm -hmm. uh, it's a beautiful story um, and he uh, depicts a similar path whereby um, in the old age the um, the hero of the journey recognizes uh, things from his past. And I remember there's a scene in it where the children are following him down the street. It's a beautiful story yeah. as far as innocence to experience goes. Mm -hmm. But um, look, I just wanted to say, John, I think the pathway you're following is really brilliant because uh, your book on Timothy, I was amazed no one had written a book on Timothy Leary before. I was amazed by that as well. <laughs> yeah, no, I honestly yeah. couldn't quite believe it. And I'm still mm. waiting for a film because what a great story that is. Yeah, um, absolutely. And also the KLF was amazing. So your choice is really brilliant. The only problem is both those books kept getting stolen from the Wellington Library. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't aware that I had any readers at all in New Zealand. I, you know, I never get mail or I don't, you know, the books aren't published there, but we get the UK version. So that's really so, lovely to hear, John. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's a, it's a very small country and um, for only 5 million people. So there's no wonder, but, you know, we've got quite an active, um, quite an active little underground uh, scene happening here. So, yeah. you know, so keep it up. It's, <laughs> we've you got we're, a Wellington Library. We've got a section of books get behind the counter. And I thought it was because uh, they were um, R-rated or whatever, William Burroughs, your books, um, various others, mm -hmm. but it was because they were the books that people kept stealing. <laughs> 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 so you've got to come to the counter. They can still steal them, but it's a bit of a filter there. So anyway, that's a kind of a, a, an odd claim to find. <laughs> yeah, I'm contraband. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, John. Uh, I think uh, there's a raised hand from uh, Jason Whitaker, who I believe is new to Blake and probably looking for some tips on further reading. I'd recommend this. <laughs> <laughs> That's what yeah, I. That's all we should go for. Um, uh, <laughs> because I've been waiting, <laughs> the, the, the funny thing is people are coming through, you know, John, it was great to talk to you last week as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we circling around each other for what feels like year, a couple of years now. So, yeah. uh, and when people are sort of the other questions coming through, oh, actually, no, I want to ask about that. No, I want to ask about that. So, so I'm going to start actually an observation and a couple of things that came up this evening that that that, that discussion about contraries. Mm. And what for me, because one of the things that I really liked when we were speaking last week, John, you sort of and you, you mentioned it tonight. Blake and clarity, which is mm. there is that moment. I think a lot of people when start reading Blake at first is kind of like, what the hell's going on? And then there's a kind of like, I, I think I said to you, or it might be somebody else, having a, for me, Blake was a moment the light bulb went on and it's never gone off in 30 years. You know, that, that um, I see the world, I, I, the way I see the world change after reading Blake. And um, the comment I probably would, which I find very useful when discussing countries, you know, particularly when you come across approaches to Blake which are very different to your own is actually Blake's distinction between a negation. Mm. Contras, co contras by definition have to realise that they are limited because that's Eurizen's problem is he thinks he's boundless, he thinks that he is the god of the universe and he fails to see that his limited vision is actually restricting everything and what he simply tries to do is negate, destroy everything that doesn't fit into that vision. And actually, and, and Anise and I, because Anise is my PhD student, so sagely as she's talking, we've often had conversations about how one of the things in the four zones is it's not good versus evil. It's it's each of them is trying to negate the other. You know, the farm says, no, no, I'm God. No, 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 says Eurism, I'm God. Mm -hmm. And that actually, I found in my, my own life that very often I can have discussions with people who have radically different political views or sexual views or spiritual views or whatever. But actually you kind of realize that each of you is part of this contrary. Yeah. It's when you 
Nature of the people who come like, no, Blake is this, and usually very Blake is crap and doesn't, you know, and should be banished from the canon, as it were, or something like that. Mm. And you've encountered then that negation, that that totalitarian worldview. Yeah. The one that I just wanted to share, Heaven, it, 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 I mentioned it last week, and it's that, that question about whether Blake's visions are real or imagined. Um, my, my own comment would be that, that, that if it's placed in an absolute form, is a false dichotomy. And Blake, Blake gave a great quote, you know, what is now proved was once only imagined. Absolutely. Things of imagination become real in the universe. And, and the quote I couldn't remember last week, it's, it's a Japanese artist. I, I recommend this book for anybody who's interested in Blake. Um, Makoto Fujimura, Fujimura is a Japanese artist who converted to Christianity but before he converted to Christianity, he became obsessed with Blake. And it's called a the theology of making. And it's basically how he as an artist came to see art as a divine act of creation. Oh, great. Yeah. And he, he's the one who kind of gives this quote that, you know, when we make something, the universe has to change to accommodate it. Yeah. So when we create something, we are doing a divine act. Yeah. So, so it's not simply that something out there, which is the kind of locking vision, you know, that out there has to be real and it impinges on our senses. Our imagination makes real. Yeah. Which is seeing stuff out there. Definitely. So, and it's, it's like Coleridge has that, that uh, he differentiates between what he, I think, fantasy, which is just when stuff is rearranged, but the universe is still essentially the same, yeah. to when real imagination produces something right. new that the universe then has to adapt to. Yeah. Um, uh, it's that, that's been very helpful to me. Yeah. That sort of thing. I, and, I, I, oh, one question I ask, when are we going to talk about Jerusalem as well? So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, but no, sorry, I interrupted you saying about imagination. No, I, I was just going to say, um, in an early draft of uh, the book, I did start to put the stuff in about the difference between, you know, uh, negation uh, and, and contraries. And I just, I, I just felt... I'm losing people here. I, I, it's, it's that's because it's not an academic book. I, there was some subjects that I started to put in, uh, and I just thought, you know, I'm not I'm not putting everything in here. There's a lot of there's a lot of details and things that uh, you could go to, but there's a large story I'm trying to tell, and if it doesn't need it, it it, it would sort of fall out. Uh, hopefully, if we get them into that great castle of Blake, then they can explore these further details. Uh, my, my, my comment for sharing is it's just one of those things I found really useful. It's been useful to me studying for many years kind of Blake and how he gets appropriated. Mm -hmm. And you realise that some people, when they do their Blake, they want their Blake and no other. And at that point, you're entering into a negation. Whereas loads of other people then, what's lovely, I think there's a quote, um, Patty Smith says it, is something William Burroughs said to her, you know, the great thing about Blake, he was so generous, he just gave away his angels for free. And that's the spirit of the contraries. Yeah. My Blake is not your Blake, but it doesn't really matter. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. We'll talk soon again, I hope, Jason. Uh, we have a raised hand from uh, the aforementioned Stephen. He's coming in out of the shadows to ask a question. Ooh. Not too shadowy. Hi, John. I really enjoyed that. I, I just love the way that you approach Blake. Um, with such ease and so relaxed. You certainly appear to be, it's just brilliant. Oh, thank you, Stephen, that's lovely. It does make a change from, uh, from more formal deliveries. Uh, it's brilliant. Um, I'm really interested, you mentioned Jung several times in your, in your book. Mm -hmm. And often Jung's used, uh, or you know, Jung's ideas are mapped onto Blake's or vice versa. Mm -hmm. but I think there's an increasing sense that Jung was actually influenced very directly by Blake. We, we know he read The Marriage of Heaven and Hell and, and the pictures mm -hmm. and so on. And I just recently came across this quotation in Jung's preface to Suzuki's book on Zen Buddhism. And it sort of relates to what we were talking about with the Zoas and the reintegration of the psyche and the being. And um, Jung uh, praises Suzuki's approach to and comparisons between Western and Eastern uh, approaches to achieving wholeness of personality as exemplified in Zen Buddhism. Yeah. And in particular, the experience of Satori or enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And Jung comments it's only... Uh, the tragedies of Goethe's Faust and Nietzsche's Zarathustra, which mark the first glimmerings of a breakthrough of total experience in our Western Hemisphere. And he adds, in this connection, I must also mention the English mystic William Blake. So 
Yeah. That comment, you, Sorry, you go. Especially when you look at Young's Red Book. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And that's, <laughs> he was in a place very similar to Blake when he was, all that was sort of pouring out of him, definitely. Yeah. And Jung talks about the soul in that context. He starts to talk about the soul rather than the psyche and has his own active imagination descent, which exactly, you Exactly, yes, the active imagination sort of thing. And of course, he's come from a, a very Eurozenic background, from a very sort of academic sort of rational sort of background, but he sort of totally broke through from that. So he's able to use his Eurozen as rational sort of thing. Um, a servant's probably not the right, the right word, but you know, in in in, uh, in balance with the other parts of of his mind, and that's yeah, yeah, that's so great. I think there's some uh, increasing uh, sense from commentators on Jung that uh, he was a visionary who felt he had to dress it as science in order to be acceptable, <laughs> um, <laughs> and thus avoiding being called mad or a madman. You know, back to those mental health issues. Sure. But if Jung, the analyst thinks that Blake is about wholeness and integration and enlightenment. Yeah. Good, isn't it? <laughs> great, yeah, great. That's me. We're, um, we're not too far away from uh, half nine, but we've got a couple of raised hands left. So if everyone's happy to go over a little bit, um, we'll, uh, we'll have those uh, two questions. So I think next was Peter. Oh. I think your microphone's off, Peter. Muted, I think. Now, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk uh, a phrase, treasures and wonders, in Blake. When you put the last full stop in your book, mm. did you find a treasure and wonder that was unexpected? That you could phrase quickly now? <laughs> <laughs> um... For me, it's the treasure and the wonder of writing that book is seeing that there's a significant amount of people, more than I expected, who seem to have been waiting for it, who seem to be ripe to sort of getting a, a wider and more um, knowledgeable understanding of Blake and wanting to have Blake in their lives they just hadn't done so yet. Uh, and I just keep hearing from people who are now doing that and embracing that. And that that's really the, the that's the gold for me, I would have thought. The goal or was that gold. was that the goal you were aiming for? Or was that, that the goal that you didn't realise was there that turned up? That's the gold, yes. Um, it's it's a it's not easy writing a book about Blake. There's a lot of long hours and a lot of thought and it's uh, you know, focused on it. And with the pandemic, a lot of my distractions sort of disappeared. So I was able to sort of fall very, very deeply uh, into his work. Uh, and you're not really thinking in terms of goals at that sort of point. You're just sort of doing it. You're just sort of doing it. Um, norm what I find normally with a book is you write a book and it's published, and then three years later, you know if it's any good. You know, three years later, if people are still asking you about it or talking about it, you know it sort of worked. So I'm still a long way from um, knowing if this book has worked. Um, 2024, I'll, I'll answer that, that one. But the, I'm certainly very pleased with the, the way people have reacted to it. Okay, thank you. We'll um, we'll look at the membership numbers in a year, John, and let you know what. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's where. Look at the sales. Look at the sales. We have, uh, I think, what will be our final question from Daniel. Right. Great. Sorry for keeping people uh, waiting. Um, I had a question about the self annihilation, John. I thought it's a very interesting. I think it's absolutely key to to Blake, and it's key to what I I think I've got out of him over over the years, mm -hmm. and I was. Um, I was intrigued actually, and I was interested to hear related to ineffable experiences, and um, which there certainly are in Blake. I'd never put the two together, to be honest. Now, and I wondered if I could push a little bit. I've always thought of, of self annihilation as a very active thing in Blake, not as a kind of passive uh, dissolution of the self, but 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 something acquired, as it were, through through effort. Um, 
both through creative work on the one hand, but also through reorientation of the way we see things, the way we relate to others. You know, the old fashioned term would be repentance, I think there's a little bit of that. And I think you see that in Laws and his labors, you see it in Milton, obviously, and you see it in Blake himself, I think. And I think the fruit of Blake's self-annihilation is the stuff that he's, he's given us. Mm. Uh, and I also think that the self-annihilation is kind of mutual. You, you, you can annihilate yourself by, by contact with other people. But also, I think, with, with encounters with the imagination outside of yourself. And I wonder if that slightly complicates, I want to hear a thought about it, whether it complicates this idea that the divine is within us, which, of, of course, it is. But, but to what extent do we actually have to kind of come face to face with it? I, I get the sense in Blake that the imagination is real right? and the imagination is personified in, in Jesus is, is real to Blake. Mm -hmm. And it's something that confronts us, it's something we're answerable to. And, and in his best moments, I think we come face to face with it. And he has Albion come face to face with it. And he paints these, you know, he's, he, he paints icons of the imagination. Yeah. Um, and I wonder, does that complicate matters slightly when we, it sounds so easy to say that all the deities reside in the human breast and so on. I mean, is there more to it? To what extent is there a kind of dynamic where we have to go out of ourselves and we have to encounter it? Uh, oh, very good question. Very good question. Um, yes, I, I suppose so. It's, it can descend on people in many different ways uh, and some of them can be more gentle than others. Uh, some it can be, you know, quite a, a, a violent shock can sort of trigger this um, this vision of the light. Um, or, I mean, I I'm, I practice transcendental meditation uh, and have done for a number of years, and I know full well that sort of shaped my understanding uh, of Blake. Because when he's talking about these states, I go, yeah, no way. I know where he's going there. I'm sort of that that makes a lot of sort of sense to me. But for me, it's 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 a much more a sort of um, uh, a gentle sort of gradual thing. You just slightly dip into it, but regularly, regular and often, regular and often, rather than a real sort of you know um, psyche destroying break that can happen. You know, if if it's um, uh, you know it can push people to a breakdown. This sort of this recognition of this other side of their, of, of, of their consciousness. I kind of think because Blake seemed comfortable with it from very early on, very, you know, as a child, that it wasn't such a, a wrench to him like it was to Swedenborg when it finally happened to Swedenborg in, in, uh, when he was in his 50s. Um, it's, you know, he, he, ta he talks, um, in one of the poems about getting into this argument with a thistle, which I, I talk about uh, in the books, it, descri it describes the various states, the uh, single vision, twofold, threefold. And there's a sense of, of uh, grace descending on him after he'd, um, after he'd used his imagination and, and come through a breakthrough with his imagination. It sort of descends to him and he's just grateful and he just sort of accepts it in this, this, this state of Beulah. Um, is uh, this temporary respite? It's a it is a passive thing, and it just sort of comes to him. And you know, it's not heaven, but it's welcome. You know that that sort that sort of thing. Uh, so yeah, so for me, it was something he was familiar with, very familiar with from earlier age. Uh, expected, um, wasn't so sort of surprised by, um, and could see it coming in many different ways, such as losing yourself in company, which you were talking about, and losing yourself in work. Um, yeah, many, many different ways. I don't know if that answer, answers your question, but it's, it's, you know, that's a fascinating side to it. Yeah, no, thank you. That helps. I, at least I understand where you're coming from a lot more. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Daniel. We have one final raised hand from Tim Heath. Ah, lovely. Hello, Tim. Good evening. And it's the time of the night when we draw the talk and the evening to a close. So I'd like to um, thank John Reardon for holding the event together and special thanks to John Higgs for enriching us all with a wonderful talk. Why be bleak when you can be Blake? But why be Blake when you can be Higgs? <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everyone, and we hope to see you again at our next meeting in July.
Thank you all very much. Thank Thanks you very much, John. And everyone. John, Thanks, everybody. Show you. <laughs> there he is. Brilliant. <laughs> As a story there, I'll tell you at some point. <laughs>